episode 27. It was a physical problem that had to be solved. How to get in touch with the girl and arrange a meeting. He did not consider any longer the possibility that she might be laying some kind of trap for him. He knew that it was not so because of her unmistakable agitation when she handed him the note. Obviously, she had been frightened out of her wits as well she might be. Nor did the idea of refusing her advances even cross his mind. Only five nights ago, he had contemplated smashing her skull in with a cobblestone, but that was of no importance. He thought of her naked, youthful body as he had seen it in his dream. He had imagined her a fool like all the rest of them, her head stuffed with lies and hatred, her belly full of ice. A kind of fever seized him at the thought that he might lose her. The white, youthful body might slip away from him. What he feared more than anything else was that she would simply change her mind if he did not get in touch with her quickly. But the physical difficulty of meeting was enormous. It was like trying to make a move at chess when you were already mated. Whichever way you turned, the telescreen faced you. Actually, all the possible ways of communicating with her had occurred to him within five minutes of reading the note. But now, with time to think, he went over them one by one, as though laying out a row of instruments on a table. Obviously, the kind of encounter that had happened this morning could not be repeated. If she had worked in the records department, it might have been comparatively simple. But he had only a very dim idea whereabouts in the building the fiction department lay, and he had no pretext for going there. If he had known where she lived and at what time she left work, he could have contrived to meet her somewhere on her way home but to try to follow her home was not safe because it would mean loitering outside the ministry, which was bound to be noticed. As for sending a letter through the mails, it was out of the question. By a routine that was not even secret, all letters were opened in transit. Actually, few people ever wrote letters. For the messages that it was occasionally necessary to send, there were printed postcards with long lists of phrases, and you struck out the ones that were inapplicable. In any case, he did not know the girl's name, let alone her address. Finally, he decided that the safest place was the canteen. If he could get her at a table by herself, somewhere in the middle of the room, not too near the telescreens, and with a sufficient buzz of conversation all around. If these conditions endured for, say, 30 seconds, it might be possible to exchange a few words. For a week after this, life was like a restless dream. On the next day, she did not appear in the canteen until he was leaving it the whistle having already blown. Presumably, she had been changed on to a later shift. They passed each other without a glance. On the day after that, she was in the canteen at the usual time, but with three other girls and immediately under a telescreen. Then, for three dreadful days, she did not appear at all. His whole mind and body seemed to be afflicted with an unbearable sensitivity, a sort of transparency which made every movement every sound every contact every word that he had to speak or listen to an agony even in sleep he could not altogether escape from her image he did not touch the diary during those days if there was any relief it was in his work in which he could sometimes forget himself for 10 minutes at a stretch he had absolutely no clue as to what had happened to her. There was no inquiry he could make. She might have been vaporized. She might have committed suicide. She might have been transferred to the other end of Oceania. Worst and likeliest of all, she might simply have changed her mind and decided to avoid him. The next day she reappeared 
Her arm was out of the sling and she had a band of sticking plaster around her wrist. The relief of seeing her was so great that he could not resist staring directly at her for several seconds. On the following day, he very nearly succeeded in speaking to her. When he came into the canteen, she was sitting at a table well out from the wall and was quite alone. It was early and the place was not very full. The queue edged forward till Winston was almost at the counter, then was held up for two minutes because someone in front was complaining that he had not received his tablet of saccharin. But the girl was still alone when Winston secured his tray and began to make for her table. He walked casually toward her, his eyes searching for a place at some table beyond her. She was perhaps three meters away from him. Another two seconds would do it. Then a voice behind him called, Smith! He pretended not to hear. Smith! repeated the voice more loudly. It was no use. He turned round. A blonde-headed, silly-faced young man named Wilshire, whom he barely knew, was inviting him with a smile to a vacant place at his table. It was not safe to refuse. After having been recognized, he could not go and sit at a table with an unattended girl. It was too noticeable. He sat down with a friendly smile. The silly, blonde face beamed into his. Winston had a hallucination of himself smashing a pickaxe right into the middle of it. The girl's table filled up a few minutes later. But she must have seen him coming toward her, and perhaps she would take the hint. Next day, he took care to arrive early. Surely enough, she was at a table in about the same place, and again, alone. The person immediately ahead of him in the queue was a small, swiftly moving, beetle-like man with a flat face and tiny, suspicious eyes. As Winston turned away from the counter with his tray, he saw that the little man was making straight for the girl's table. His hopes sank again. There was a vacant place at a table further away, but something in the little man's appearance suggested that he would be sufficiently attentive to his own comfort to choose the emptiest table. With ice at his heart, Winston followed. It was no use unless he could get the girl alone. At this moment, there was a tremendous crash. The little man was sprawling on all fours. His tray had gone flying. Two streams of soup and coffee were flowing across the floor. He started to his feet with a malignant glance at Winston, whom he evidently suspected of having tripped him up. But it was all right. Five seconds later, with a thundering heart, Winston was sitting at the girl's table. He did not look at her. He unpacked his tray and promptly began eating. It was all important to speak at once before anyone else came, but now a terrible fear had taken possession of him. A week had gone by since she had first approached him. She would have changed her mind. She must have changed her mind. It was impossible that this affair should end successfully. Such things did not happen in real life. He might have flinched altogether from speaking if at this moment he had not seen Ampleforth, the hairy-eared poet wandering limply round the room with a tray, looking for a place to sit down. In his vague way, Ampleforth was attached to Winston and would certainly sit down at his table if he caught sight of him. There was perhaps a minute in which to act. Both Winston and the girl were eating steadily. The stuff they were eating was a thin stew, actually a soup of ericot beans. In a low murmur, Winston began speaking. Neither of them looked up. Steadily, they spooned the watery stuff into their mouths and between spoonfuls exchanged the few necessary words in low, expressionless voices. What time do you leave work? 18.30. Where can we meet? Victory Square, near the monument. It's full of telescreens. It doesn't matter if there's a crowd. Any signal? No. Don't come up to me until you see me among a lot of people. And don't look at me, just keep somewhere near me. What time? 19 hours. All right. Ampleforth failed to see Winston and sat down at another table. 
they did not speak again. And so far as it was possible for two people sitting on opposite sides of the same table, they did not look at one another. The girl finished her lunch quickly and made off, while Winston stayed to smoke a cigarette. 